when I was visiting the Frick with Sylvain Belanger. Some of you might remember that name. And we were fortunate that Emerson took us through his exhibition of the very important sculpture, the student of Jacques-Louis David, David Anger. Since that triumph, he has been involved as lead curator and author for a number of important exhibitions, including Luminous Worlds, British Works on Paper, 1760 to 1900 at the Fine Arts Museum in San Francisco, and the absolutely groundbreaking exhibition that I hope you saw at the Met, Like Life, Sculpture, Color, and Body, which was at the Breuer satellite of the Met in 2018. It's that time when he was working on it that I tracked him down and asked him to join the Art Institute family. And since then in Chicago, I can say he has accelerated his publications, his exhibitions, his acquisitions, right? Mm -hmm. Don't you think? I mean, it's like, okay. Um, in fact, after today's lecture, he'll be racing to O'Hare and to be part of the press conference and the private opening for the exhibition on Antonio Canova, uh, sculpting and sculpting, sketching in clay, which will come to the Art Institute in November. And he was the co-curator on this. Today, he'll be speaking about one of the most important sculptures of the 19th century that you'll be hearing much more about when we open the exhibition with her name in the title in October. Please welcome Emerson to the podium. And this is, I think, his first, but certainly not his last time to speak at the Alliance Francaise. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here today. I'm thrilled to be here, and particularly as I didn't realize that this is the Julius Lewis Auditorium, which made me very happy. Julius was my protector when I first arrived in Chicago, and we had a pretty pretty regular Friday night date. <laughs> so it's it's I, I didn't realize that he that, that this was named after him. So it's just absolutely lovely. Um, thank you to everybody who who helped this happen today. I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, um, particularly to speak about an artist who's become very close to my heart, um, and that is Camille Claudel. Uh, she was a trailblazing sculptor who, in the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Okay. <laughs> Um. Ah. <laughs> so Camille Claudel was a trailblazing sculptor who in the late 19th and early 20th centuries defied the social expectations of her time to pursue a powerful and expressive exploration of the human form. Largely forgotten for most of the 20th century, following her confinement in a psychiatric institution for the final 30 years of her life, she was rediscovered in the 1980s. Since then, her undeniably tragic life has firmly entered the realm of pop culture. Her passionate relationship with Auguste Rodin and mental decline have provided rich fodder for a cottage industry in movies, plays, novels, musicals, and operatic scores. And here you see three um, important uh, takes on her life that have come out since the 1980s. The first is the, um, the groundbreaking film, Camille Claudel by Bruno Nuitain, um, which many of you may remember. Um, it really was what, shot the artist to fame again in the minds of the public. Um, it's a sweeping historical drama, <laughs> costume drama, and it, it's a lot of fun. It's also in hindsight now, completely sensationalized, <laughs> um, but still worth a look. And, and it's always amazing to watch Isabella Diani. Um, more recently in 2013, um, the wonderful Juliette Binoche um, played the character of Claudel in um, Bruno Dumont's 
uh, Camille Claudel 1915. It was a very different take. Um, there wasn't really a script, and so she had to really spend a lot of time getting into character um, and thinking and speaking the way she thought that Claudel would. Um, it was about a year in the life of Claudel in the psychiatric institution. So it wasn't about her art or her art making, um, although she would sort of think about those things while she was there. Um, and then finally, my real favorite, um, which is an operatic piece written in 2010 by Jake Heggie, um, a song cycle called Camille Claudel Into the Fire. Um, it's absolutely magnificent. Each of the songs in the cycle is based around a single work by Claudel. Um, so it's, it's as much as it's about her biography, it's also about her artworks, which I really love. Um, and it was written especially for Joyce Di Donato and um, they've performed it everywhere in the world at this point. Um, and it's, I encourage you all to find it if you haven't heard it before, um, because it's wonderful. Now, despite the increased awareness of the artist that endeavors such as these have achieved, other examples, not these ones, um, have often spun sensationalist and melodramatic tales of doomed romance, victimhood, and madness. This biographical miasma has tended to obscure or even excise the sculptor's art and agency, but she was an extraordinary artist whom the French critic Octave Mirbeau memorably described as something unique, a revolt of nature, a woman genius. <laughs> I started thinking about the artist about four years ago. I had found an unpublished letter written by Claudel in our museum's archives. This was quite extraordinary, as it was assumed that all of her surviving correspondence had been accounted for. The letter was written from Paris in late 1892, on the eve of the Chicago's World Fair, and addressed to the Empress of Chicago, Bertha Palmer. It's both a savvy and moving missive. Um, Claudel notes immediately that she'd heard that Bertha was interested in women artists, and she'd probably heard that through Rodin. Um, who had contacts in America, and um, he'd probably been told about Bertha's involvement with the Women's Pavilion at the, um, the World's Fair. And so she dives straight in trying to appeal to Bertha, and she says, look, I'm exhibiting a sculpture there in Chicago next year. It's my portrait of Rodin, of course. Um, and she said, I'll let you have a bronze or a plaster for certain amounts of money. So it's very bold play to make to someone that you've never heard of before and someone who was very rich and powerful. Um, and then she says, you know, I hope you will understand why I'm contacting you like this. I'm sure you understand how difficult it is to be a woman artist. And to, to read that knowing her life now, it's really a very moving, moving letter. Um, unfortunately, we don't know if Bertha bought her portrait, a version of her portrait of Rodin. I suspect not because Bertha hated Rodin. Um, there were about 10 years where people were trying to get her to commission a work from him. Um, eventually she commissioned a portrait from him and um, unfortunately refused to sit for it. Um, and so he was basically, ooh, computers just died. So he was basically, um, they would have to sort of manhandle her into his studio to get her to pose for him. And he was complaining constantly that it just didn't, you know, he didn't have enough time anyway. It took a few years, but he finally finished the marble. And then she never went to see it. She never picked it up and she never paid for it. <laughs> so it's still in the Musée Rodin in Paris today, which I think is fabulous. I mean, it's, it's why I love Bertha. Um, and, <laughs> and so this got me really thinking about Claudel. And I realized there hadn't been um, an exhibition on the artist in America, a, a purely monographic show in over 30 years. Um, and it seemed like exactly the right time to do something. Um, simultaneously, I had been looking for a work by Claudel for the museum. Um, this is very hard to do right now. Claudel's oeuvre is really small. Um, you know, there are probably only about 80 80 known compositions. She destroyed many of her works um, later in her life. Um, and she wasn't popular like Rodin. Um, she didn't have the same patronage system that he did. And so there are not 
too many casts of her bronzes. And then the unique works like the marbles, the terracottas, the plasters, um, they're almost all accounted for by French museums at this point. Um, we were very lucky um, just two years ago, um, a new discovery was made and it was this bust that you see here. Um, nobody knew about it. And because the dealers in Paris knew we'd been looking for a work by her and because we were doing the exhibition, they called on us first, which is what we always like to see. Um, and we, I don't, Gloria, I don't think we, there was any question. I mean, you went to see it in Paris. We just both fell in love with this work. Um, it's a unique um, version of her portrait of her brother, Paul. It was probably done when she was about 20 years old. Um, and it is, it, it shows immediately how absolutely, you know, talented this precocious young woman was. Um, it depicts her brother as a kind of, um, uh, as a, as a, as a, an ancient Roman um, patriarch or, uh, um, or, or as a Roman emperor or something like that. Um, you can see that beautiful drapery across, which sort of breaks up the formality of that, that, that front on pose. Um, what's unique about this version of the piece is that she painted it herself um, in transparent or translucent layers of yellows, browns, reds, and even greens, you can see up here. And what we think she was trying to do is imitate the oxidized surfaces of ancient Greek and Roman bronzes, um, something that had been dragged up from the bottom of the ocean. And she would have seen a number of things like that um, at the Louvre, which was a museum that she went to often, like all art students. Um, so, so achieving the acquisition of this piece has now really allowed us to move forward um, very confidently in our work on Claudel. So I encourage you to see it um, next time you're at the museum. It's right in front of Gustav Kaibot's Paris Street Rainy Day. So we've given her a real pride of place, um, which is only what she deserves. Um, so Camille was born in 1864 um, in a small town some 60 miles north northeast of Paris. Um, in, in 1876, um, her father got a new job, and so the whole family um, moved down to Nogent-sur-Seine, uh, which is about 60 miles southeast of Paris. Um, it was in that town that Claudel, still a teenager, modelled her first pieces. In a long article he wrote about the artist in 1898, Matthias Morhart described a family home turned into a studio by an imperious Claudel, where her brother, her sister, and the servants played the parts of models and assistants. The family moves to Paris um, in 1881 so that Claudel can study art. And this was really because her father adored her and, um, and wanted to do anything he could to support her. The mother was a different story <laughs> um, and plays a quite awful role um, later on in Claudel's life. Um, she, Claudel, enrolls at the Academy Colorossi, which was one of the few private schools that allowed women to receive an artistic education and to study from the nude. Um, this was, they were barred from entry to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which was um, the government and the major art school in Paris at the time. Um, later on, Claudel rented a studio in Paris, which she shared with other young aspiring women artists um, from all different nations. They pulled the expenses for rent and models fees as well. Models were quite expensive and you can imagine how necessary they are for sculptors. Um, so as an aspiring woman in the later 19th century, Claudel was hardly an anomaly. The rise of women artists and women's art education during that period has become increasingly well-documented. Hundreds of women worked, studied, and exhibited in Paris during the 1880s and 1890s, but relatively few achieved any notoriety in the field of sculpture, which, unlike painting or drawing, continued to be a bastion of masculine enterprise. Densely material, largely reliant on the nude, physically demanding, expensive to produce, and bound up in male-dominated and politicized systems of state patronage, Sculpture was not a polite art, and Claudel's ambition in that arena was inherently transgressive. She was around 20 when she entered Rodin's studio. We don't know precisely how this happened, 
Um, we don't even know precisely what year. <laughs> uh, we know that definitely by 1884, um, she, her name appears in one of his um, ledgers, um, but it could have been as early as 1882. Um, she had been working with the sculptor Alfred Boucher in Paris, um, but he was given the directorship of um, the Académie de France in Rome. And so when he moved, he put Rodin in touch with Claudel and he would occasionally come to her studio and sort of you do art criticism on her compositions. But it was pretty soon after that that she actually formally entered his studio. And he was a real up and coming artist at the time. Um, he wasn't at the height of his powers, which would come you know, 10, 20 years later in terms of global fame, but he was well on the way. And so it was a real coup um, for her to be included in the work of this very, very busy and important studio. And so you can imagine the admiration she must have felt for this man. Um, on the left, you see her portrait of Rodin, the portrait that she tried to sell to Bertha Palmer. Um, it exists in about 12 different um, casts and um, it was produced a couple of years after she entered his studio. And you can see here, I mean, getting the man to sit down long enough to even pose was, you know, a triumph. And it showed that he was willing to allow her to work on his portrait, um, that he thoroughly agreed with the idea of it. Um, it is a remarkable representation of Rodin. I mean, not only is it a, is it a very good likeness, as you, I think you can see, um, you know, she's not only produced an homage to her teacher, She's produced an homage to her teacher's style. I mean, she's also showing off here that she has conquered the style of Rodin. She can sculpt the way that he does. Um, and to do that on a portrait of Rodin is I think very, very, very interesting. Um, I love the beard, which becomes this sort of craggy rock face, um, you know, which sort of reminds you of um, certain elements of Rodin sculptures like the the base of the thinker and things like that. Um, and it became his quasi official portrait. And he often requested that it be exhibited in shows of his, um, uh, shows of his work um, in Paris and beyond. Um, now, Rodin for his part made, oh, it was, it was a delay. Um, Rodin for his part made many used Claudel's likeness many, many times in his sculpture. Um, the difference was that every time he used her face, it was not as a portrait. It was always as an allegorical work or a symbolist work. Um, so here, this is not a portrait of Camille Claudel. This is called thought. Um, so I think it's very, very interesting that she took him as the person he was and he would transform her into, you know, uh, unreal things. Um, and this is probably the most famous of his portraits of her. Um, it is absolutely remarkable, this, this untouched rectangular block of stone from which her head seems to be, and it's a little ambiguous, either emerging or sinking into. Um, and I think that you can think many ways about this sculpture. Um, you know, is, is the power of her thought animating stone here? Um, or is it the power of Rodin that is animating the production, of the, 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 the emergence of this, of this, um, this figure and Claudel herself? Um, and you, of course, all of, all of the critics in Paris, of course, would have known that this was Camille Claudel. Um, her place within his studio was fairly well known. Um, and she had herself had been exhibiting at the Paris Salon since about 1885. Um, so she was also very well known on the art scene. So to see her pictured like this, even though it's called thought, everybody would have known um, exactly who it depicted. Um, in the studio, Claudel was a model, an assistant, a collaborator, a romantic partner, while also trying to find the time to produce her own works and exhibit them at the Paris Salons. Now, she was not a simple laborer or compliant student under Rodin, far from it. 
As the journalist Morhart described, he consults her on everything. He, on each decision to be taken, he deliberates with her, and it is only after having agreed that he decides definitively. This is how Matthias describes Claudel in the studio in the decade or so in which he was in his studio. Everyone who visited the studio remembers her, silent and diligent. She remains seated in her little chair. She barely listens to the long chatter of idlers. Solely occupied with her work, she kneads in clay and models the foot or the hand of a figure placed in front of her. Sometimes she raises her head. She looks at the visitor with her big clear eyes, whose light is so interrogative and so persistent. Then she immediately resumes her interrupted work. Now, she was involved in a number of Rodin's commissions, including um, The Gates of Hell that you just saw on the screen behind. Um, the Burgers of Calais was another example. Um, we know that she, she modeled the hands and feet for some of the figures in The Gates of Hell. Um, here is um, a hand study that she did we don't think it was for any any of Rodin's compositions um, because we can't match it with anything and we can't match it with any of her own compositions. So this was probably an independent study that she made um, while she was in Rodin's studio. Um, and we know that it was probably intended to be seen as an independent piece because on some of the versions, they're signed by her. Um, Now, there've been a lot of problems posthumously um, with Claudel's time in Rodin's studio um, because there are a number of compositions that it is very, very difficult to tell if they were by Rodin or by Claudel. And unfortunately, historically, the way that worked was always in the favor of Rodin. <laughs> so <laughs> if it looks good, it was by Rodin. Um, so for example, this is, a, this is a perfect example. This is a head of a laughing boy, study of a head, um, probably from a live model. Um, and it was cast in 1925. The plaster was found in Rodin's studio. It was cast in 1925. Claudel was not around. I mean, she was in the countryside in the mental institution. Rodin was dead. Um, so there was not really anyone there who was able to, um, to advise on these matters. And so they immediately assumed that this was by, by Rodin. And so they added Rodin's signature. And it was not until the 2000s, and so, and this entered the Philadelphia Museum in 1929. Um, and it was not until the early 2000s that um, we discovered Oh, we've lost the PowerPoint. Uh, um, oh, that's not it. Ah. It wasn't until the early 2000s that this plaster was discovered. Um, and you can see how it has a, a longer base on it. Mm -hmm. And on the back of that base is Claudel's signature. Yeah. Um, now, this this happens a lot with um, Claudel's works. Um, and, you know, she's also the victim of um, people assuming that it is the teacher who always influences the student. In fact, Claudel and Rodin had a sort of mutual exchange, a very intense mutual exchange of ideas throughout her time in the studio. And this is a perfect example. So on the left, you see her young girl with a sheaf um, beautiful terracotta model um, from 1887. And we know that it was done in 1887 because there's a photo of her in the studio with it from that year. And then you see in marble in 1888, Rodin does the exact same composition essentially and calls it Galatea. Um, you know, so, so we have to really think carefully about the complex relationship between these two artists. And because she was a woman, it was never thought of in that way. If, if there was something similar to Rodin, then she must have copied him. And it was the same with the critics during her lifetime. Um, you know, the progressive critics, um, the more left-leaning critics were very, very enthusiastic about Claudel's work and thought more carefully about it. Um, the more conventional critics 
their knee-jerk response to everything was, well, it looks like Rodan. Or, oh, she needs to develop her own style. And, and you can only imagine how that would have driven an, a young artist completely insane. Um, not enough to say that that ends up where it does. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's it's really, it's, it, it must have been absolutely awful. I mean, there were moments, and she really took these things to heart. There were moments where, it, uh, there's at least one moment where a newspaper publishes something um, about um, this work here on the left and says, oh, she's just copied Rodin. And she was so incensed that she sent a letter to the newspaper demanding a retraction. <laughs> so she was no wallflower, our Camille Claudel. Um, she was quick to temper. She had a waspish tongue. She had trouble making friends. Um, but I think she had to have that kind of personality as a woman in that art world at that point in time. Here's another example of Claudel and Rodin sort of thinking about similar things, um, but their approach has been quite, quite different. So on the right, you see the earlier piece, which is Rodin's Crouching Woman, um, which was about 1880, 1882. And then two years later, you have Claudel working on something similar um, in his studio. And I think you can see immediately that Claudel is much more interested in the, the realism of the body, or the naturalism of the body. She also seems to have a completely different understanding of the realities of the female body. <laughs> I mean, she, you know, you, you sense the weight, the effort of, you know, crouching in that, what is essentially an impossible position to pose in. Um, and I tried it once, it wasn't pretty. And, um, and on the left, you have Rodin's utterly eroticized um, version with the woman's legs splayed out to the viewer. I mean, Clodel never does things like this. Um, and we'll see another example a little bit later on where we can see the differences um, between these two artists. Um, here is her being utterly inventive and taking a pre-existing composition and radically cutting it a few years later. Um, this is an extraordinary bronze bought by the Getty a few years ago. Um, and it's also a recent acquisition for them, hence why they're our partners on this exhibition. Um, and you can see how she's been sort of both inspired by um, ancient statuary um, that's come down to us broken and fragmented, but also she's interested, I think, in, um, it's an early interest in what will become, you know, a modernist interest in the fragmented body by people like Brancusi. Um, and it's it's an absolutely astonishing work. And you can see the rib cage there at the back. I mean, the ripples of that that structure are extraordinary. Um, her first major success was Sakuntala. And you're probably wondering why did none of these actually say Sakuntala. It's a complicated um, work with a complicated history. Um, she first exhibited the composition in plaster in 1886. The plaster survives, but in a damaged state. Um, it's not really worth looking at. She, like many of the times that she exhibits works at the Salon, she then writes to the French government to ask them to commission her to produce a marble version or a bronze version. Claudel had a very difficult time getting state patronage. It would always go to the men. There was always something wrong with what she did. And um, so it was very rare for her to um, get a state commission. In this case, she didn't. And it wasn't until, you know, 20 years later that a female patron of Claudel's commissioned her to do the same composition, basically, in marble. This time, however, it was called Vertumnus and Pomona. And um, so she used the same composition to illustrate a very different story. Um, uh, this story uh, from Ovid. Um, he, he, you have her though in 1884, um, working on the original clay model um, for the composition. Um, it's so highly polished and she carved it herself. Um, as it neared its completion, she proudly declared that my marble group is becoming marvelous. It's like mother of pearl. And I really want to emphasize Claudel as a marble carver here because it was almost unheard of 
for a woman artist to, to carve in marble. It was very, very difficult and demanding physically. Marble was extraordinarily expensive. Um, also, not many people realize this, but Rodin didn't carve a single marble in his entire life. Um, he didn't have the skills, he never learned um, properly. And um, so every marble you see by Rodin, he had contracted somebody else to carve that for him. Claudel carved her own marbles and she was very proud of that because I guess in a way it was one way of distinguishing herself from him. Um, and here you have her in 1905 carving that very marble. Now it's a little it's a little misleading this photograph because she would never have been carving in a day dress. I mean she has no apron on, you know. So and she you would not hold that's a that's not a very a good way to hold you know I mean it, it's all for show for a magazine but um but she did want to be pictured this way um, which I think is really important um, so uh, the composition also evolved into a slightly different version um, called the abandonment with this more general title she capitalized on a more immediately comprehensible and universal theme which is the submission to love you have to remember that almost from the moment that she entered Rodin's studio, she and Rodel fell madly in love with each other. Um, and so this would have been created at the height of their romance. I don't think that we can say that it's always entirely about biography. I would hate to do that for this sculpture because she had very specific themes that she was dealing with. Um, but this was a happy time in her life. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's it's extraordinary the way she she's, created this composition with, with the man who's just dropped to his knees, embracing the woman who, who, who submits in a way to love. And, you know, and down comes, down comes the head, the arm hanging on the other side. Um, it's extremely different in many ways to similar compositions by Rodin. Um, and I think the, the kiss is an interesting example just because um, years later, Claudel's brother, who was a very famous writer and diplomat, um, he wrote this about the comparison between these two works. And I think it's very telling and I think it's right. In the first, he said, referencing the kiss, the man is, so to speak, seated to dine at the woman. He sits down to enjoy her. Um, he uses both hands and she does her best, as they say in American English, to deliver the goods. In my sister's group, the spiritual is everything. The man on his knees is pure desire. His face lifted, he embraces this marvelous being, this sacred flesh given to him from above before he even dares to seize it. It is impossible to see anything at the same time more passionate and more chaste. Sakuntala, or the, the, the Vertumnus and Pomona, seems actually a little closer in some ways to um, this, uh, another famous work by Rodin, Eternal Idol. Um, however, there again are great important differences. Um, the woman here has such a, a distance to her. There's no engagement. She is treated like something to be worshiped um, and, and, and almost a little femme fatale. Um, whereas Claudel is showing the real coming together of a couple um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a passionate, emotional, um, and, and very moving way. One of my favorite works by Claudel is The Waltz. Um, it's an audaciously erotic depiction of two lovers who have surrendered themselves to the exhilarating rhythms of a dance. In Claudel's initial conception, both figures were completely nude, and a French government art inspector was scandalized by its, quote, shocking accentuation of reality. Subsequent versions added draperies, which only enhanced the dynamic movement of the couple. Rather than a single moment in time, the work seems to suggest an ongoing, diagonally ascendant movement that threatens to launch the figures from the ground. This is not at all what we expect from sculpture. This is not standing upright. There's no gravity to this. This is a defiance of gra gravity, which is completely goes against what sculpture is supposed to be like. Um, she first exhibited the work in plaster in 1893. 
Um, and it was this particular version of which there is only one cast, and this is it. Um, and it, it, it shows her responses to the art inspector's criticism. You can see the voluminous drapery now and the hair that goes up, um, you know, in this extraordinary way um, and veils above her head. Um, the male figure remains pretty much nude though. Um, praising this evolved version of the composition, the government inspector wrote that the overtly realistic details have been sufficiently veiled. <laughs> the light scarf that clings to the woman's sides, leaving her entire torso nude, an admirable torso, gracefully turned away as if to escape a kiss, ends in a sort of quivering train. It is like a torn sheath from which there is suddenly emerges a winged thing. It's quite a beautiful description, I think. Um, Clodell eventually simplified the composition um, and, and it's, uh, it's this version of the composition that starts to be um, reproduced on, on a wider scale. Um, it's just as glorious, I think. Um, and and it, it, in a way, it, it's, it's a little easier to see what's going on between the figures when she's removed all the sort of, you know, flying veils. Um, she produced versions in plaster, in bronze, even in ceramic. These were, this was a very popular composition. Several of these were purchased by or given as gifts to her friends, um, especially in, in this case to the composer Claude Debussy, um, who was a friend of hers, and I suspect probably a little in love with her for a time. Um, and it was said that a plaster version of this composition sat above his piano for the rest of his career. And that I just think it's a perfectly Debussy um, in a way, this piece. Um, so Claudel grew increasingly angered by Rodin's refusal to leave Rose Bourret, the devoted companion who had shared his life since 1864 and who bore his son. Um, Claudel's hatred of the woman was apparent in various caricatures she drew of Rodin and Beret. Um, here you see Rodin and Chained, um, and walking off into the distance is this sort of hag like Beret <laughs> wielding a broom. Um, and there are a number of these caricatures. And, um, you know, I, I feel a little awkward showing them because I think they were very, very private works to her. Um, and, you know, they make her seem a little bit. You know, unbalanced about um, the complexities of their menage a trois, but, um, you know, um, and to be honest, Rose often gets left out of this story a lot. I mean, Claudel is always the victim, and but Rose was also a victim. Uh, Rodin refused to marry her until very late in life. Um, he didn't acknowledge the son. Um, and he was running around town with, with Camille. So, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I think it shows us very clearly that the sort of disregard that Rodin had for the feelings of either women at, at some level, um, as much as he absolutely adored Claudel. Um, so in 1893, um, she definitively breaks with Rodin um, and, and finds her own studio, um, in Paris's working class 13th arrondissement. Stung by continued comparison of her sculptures with those of Rodin, she determined to forge a new style. Taking inspiration from incidents she supposedly witnessed from everyday life, she embarked on a series of compositions depicting scenes such as women talking together, women bathing in the ocean, and lone figures sleeping or in reverie before fireplaces. You see, she explained to her brother in a letter, it is no longer anything like Rodin. Imagine if that was your sort of raison d'etre for thinking about your own work, that it just had to be different to somebody else's. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very strange um, way to be an artist, I think. Um, and she was right that these works like this are nothing like Rodin. You know, he was never drawn to quotidian moments, to figures and situations that mirrored the potentially magical minutiae of everyday life. Miniature in scale and sometimes using novel materials and mixtures of materials, Claudel's sketches from nature focused above all on the intimacy, the poetry, the humanity of lived experiences. 
one critic when she first um, displayed this composition, the chatterboxes at the salon, said, by taking the ordinary parts of life and instilling them with art and plasticity, Mademoiselle Claudel has created a new art. She has struck gold, a gold that is hers alone, which must have pleased her enormously. <laughs> um, the chatterboxes depicts a group of nude women seated on benches. Three of them lean forward, raptly listening to the fourth. Um, it's sometimes called the gossipers, but I think what's going on is a little, um, a little more general than that, and, and a little more, a little more fun in a way. Um, Wide-eyed and open-mouthed, their bodies straining and their hair whipping around them, the figures possess an extraordinary vitality. In the definitive green onyx marble version, shown on the left, no, well, you can see here, um, the figures possess an extraordinary, um, the women are sheltered by cocoon-like walls and project an air of whispered revelations. Um, devoid of grand mythological, allegorical, or historical themes, distinctly unclassical in the figures' poses and physiognomies, and miniature in scale, the work struck many critics as unprecedented. It is an incredible piece um, and carved by herself um, from a material that was very difficult to work with. Um, you know, it was sort of like marble, but it had a, a, a greater hardness to it. Um, and I wonder if she'd, she had a very great interest in Japanese art. And I wonder if she'd been looking at jades and things like that. Um, you know, there are also very interesting parallels here between, you know, the project of the French intimist painters um, like Edouard Vuillard at much the same time. Um, here you see, you know, three women again in the corner of an, of an interior. Um, talking or conversing, um, but they're also completely different. Uh, Claudel is not giving any specificity like Vuillard does to, to tell us where we are in space and time. We're in a bourgeois apartment in Paris. Um, Claudel leaves all the figures nude, um, doesn't give us any real sense of where the figures are. And so there, for me, becomes something a little more universal about what she's trying to do. Um, this is another fantastic work from the series, Sketches from Nature, and this is The Wave. Um, and it was almost certainly inspired by the Hokusai print. Um, Clodel visited um, the two commercial galleries of, of Japanese art frequently in Paris. Um, and what's interesting though, is she makes it her own. Um, you see here, three women bathing in the shadow of a, of a wave that's about to break on them. But there's no real sense of fear. Um, the wave is not, you know, monumental the way it is in Hokusai. I mean, it's not going to create damage on a vast scale. Um, it, it's a totally different moment of togetherness of women enjoying themselves. And that is so unique to Claudel. I mean, it's not really, you know, something that a lot of male artists um, were, were interested in or, or good at. Um, you know, on the other hand, we can use this Paul Gauguin painting to sort of stand in for the majority of treatments of women and water at that point in the, in the 19th century, which was a sort of equation between womanhood and the sort of wild, unpredictable, um, primitive nature of the sea. You know, here she is almost in sexual communion with the ocean. Um, Claudel's is an, an entirely different um, understanding or, or approach to um, similar subject matter. And it's just extraordinary. Um, this is the last work that I'm going to talk about um, because it is the only sort of definitively biogra autobiographical work in Claudel's oeuvre. Um, she started thinking about it in 1893, which was just after she'd left Rodin. And it was such an ambitious sculpture that it took her a number of years um, to finally get it into existence. Um, there is only one cast um, uh, that was made with her overseen. Um, and this is it here. Um, it's at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, but we'll be coming to Chicago in October. Um, you know, it's a singular artistic achievement and perhaps her most ambitious sculpture. 
both universal and transparently autobiographical, it depicts the path of life or human destiny. In it, there is a woman at the left here, um, representing old age or death, who leads a middle-aged man away from a kneeling abandoned youth. Old age pressed against, well, first I'll show you, the, on the left is her, her first attempt at the composition. Um, so there are anatomical deformities and things like that, because it's really just a sketch. Um, but what's very, very interesting is the way that the composition changes. Um, you know, you have here this sort of entangled threesome, a sort of tug of war on the left, um, sort of like a modern day Le Alcorn, um, where the kneeling youth is grasping onto the man's hand. You know, his, his back leg is bending as if he's maybe going to fall back into her arms. By the time we get to the finished piece, it's a completely different composition. The hands no longer touch, there's a break. The composition is swirling upwards diagonally and, 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 and there's really no coming back from that. The old woman who is now like a sort of parasite pressed to his back is inevitably leading him away into the future and abandoning um, the young girl. Now, many viewers at the time would absolutely have associated the man with Rodin, the elderly woman and kneeling youth with Rose and Camille respectively. Um, decades later, Claudel's brother, Paul, identified the kneeling figure as, quote, my sister, my sister Camille, imploring, humiliated, kneeling, this superb woman, this proud woman. This is how she is represented, imploring, humiliated, kneeling and naked. Um, the composition was a real success when it was first exhibited in plaster and prompted one critic to declare, we can no longer call Mademoiselle Claudel a student of Rodin, she is a rival. Claudel sought a commission in bronze from the French government, but after initially promising negotiations, the contract was abruptly canceled. It's been fairly convincingly argued, I think, that Rodin intervened personally to prevent the state from supporting a work that seemed to expose his private life. Um, around 1905, um, Claudel's loyal supporter and advocate, Eugène Bleu, who was an, um, an art editor and, um, and, and had a foundry for making bronzes. He made these, he, he disassembled the composition in a way in order to produce the imploring youth as a singular object of its own. Um, and it was made in two sizes. Um, this is the large size you see here. It was cast in, exa in six examples, um, very rare today. And there's a smaller version that was cast, I think, in about 25 versions. Um, and for, I think it, it, as a separated object, it loses none of its emotional power. Um, it becomes something slightly different. Um, it becomes more open-ended and generally evocative of supplication, of loss, of abandonment, um, of longing. Um, it perhaps became better known than the age of maturity, um, which was the, 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 the wider, fuller composition, because that bronze didn't even make it into the Musée d'Orsay until the 1980s. So it was in a private collection all that time. So it was more likely that people saw this version of just um, one of the figures and, it, you know, in a commercial sort of uh, tabletop um, um, object that was more easily accessible. Um, now, on December 1st, 1901, the writer Maurice Potasher sent art critic Jeff, Gustave Geoffroy a worrisome letter. He said, I saw Mademoiselle Claudel today. She's exhausted to the point of despair. She wants to abandon her art and she's already broken some of her molds. Her stormy and somewhat bizarre nature certainly explains in part the solitude, abandon, and near financial distress to which she has been reduced after having known all the promises of success. This alludes to what will become very serious financial problems 
and foreshadows the decline of her mental health, mental and physical health, in the last decade of her activity um, as an artist, um, before she was confined in a psychiatric hospital on March 10th, 1913. Um, she did produce um, a number of works in that final decade of activity. Um, I don't have time to go into them now, they're, they're wonderful. Um, but I think this really is the sort of the, the, the great last gasp of, of, of original compositions um, by the artist in a certain way. And I thought it was a nice bookend to today's lecture because it, it's the closing out of her relationship with Rodin, um, her account, her personal account of love, loss, um, abandonment, um, Paul wrote a letter um, to, to a family member um, so soon before she was confined in the psychiatric institution. He said, in Paris, Camille mad, wallpaper torn away in long strips, a single broken and torn armchair, horribly dirty. She is enormous, her face dirty, talking incessantly in a monotonous metallic voice. Um, and she was diagnosed by doctors with um, what they then called paranoid psychosis. Um, her family essentially forcibly interred her in the institution. Um, her mother led the charge um, and it all happened two days after her father died. So as soon as the protector was gone, they, the family swept in. Um, and when she was there, she refused to make art. So for the last 30 years of her life, um, she didn't make any art. And, you know, after 10 years or so, the doctors started contacting the family to say, you know what, we think she's probably fine to go home. Um, and the family refused. Um, they prevented her from receiving letters except from family at the institution. Um, and then finally in 1943, when she died, um, the family didn't collect the body. And so she was placed in a mass grave. Oh. Um, and, you know, it's absolutely awful. Um, and, but she's left us these amazing, amazing artworks, which finally in the last 30 years have gotten their due. So thank you very much. That was incredible. And you can see just how much passion has gone into his research and why we're doing this. And she's going to be, her name is going to be back, 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 back. Right? And there's just going to be lots around this exhibition. I can't wait. And we open it and then it goes to the Getty. So we always like it when we come first. So, uh, um, we have some time for some questions. So I'm the gentil moderate speech. So, 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 Oh, yes. oh, so this this photograph it's really annoying actually this photograph is the only photograph that the Musée d'Orsay has of their sculpture and they unfortunately didn't remove the sculpture to a photographic studio with blank walls to have it done so what you see in the background is the Musée d'Orsay and someone else's sculpture sticking up behind <laughs> Photo bombing. Earlier, there was a work in which, to me anyway, appeared to be an wondered What did the sculpture look like? Further. Well, 
I'm not sure. <laughs> there, there, there. there. Oh. there, there. It, it looks like it's odd. I know the, the large photo. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, here. Yes. Yes. Um, that's a reflection. Oh, God. Yeah. No, bronzes are tricky like that because they change in the light. So um, two different photos of the same bronze will look differently because the light has reflected off the surface slightly differently. Well, you know, I think I think in the very breakup of the body here, you are sort of moving towards different techniques that those later artists will definitely start to 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 use in a very prolonged, regular, serious way. Yeah. Um, do you know of any fictionalized history or historical, well, you know, um, fiction? Uh, such as some of the books I've read lately, I like Jensenesky's, uh -huh. and I love those. Oh, those are fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, are there any that have me? Yes, yeah. there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll have to get their names for you, though. I don't have it right on me. So if you give me your email address, then I'll, I'll yes, absolutely. And there's actually, I mean, the yeah. best thing to read is a book by um, a French professor who was at Stanford. I'm not sure if she's still there. Um, and it's it's a biography, but it's 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 not dry. It's beautifully written. It's just quotes from all the major players the whole way through. It's a really really wonderful read. No, you know, it's it's more of a biography biography, but it it reads very well. Um, just it's not dry at all. But there was a there was a famous novelized sort of version by Anne Delba. I think um, a French author it, in the, in the late eighties, early nineties, it sort of blew up. I mean, it was very popular in its translation into English, but also in French. Um, Delba, D E L B A T. Um, I'm pretty sure that's it. Um, Any other um, questions? It's not working very well, so mm -hmm. try to yes, loud. Wrong voice. Um, I'm wondering how you felt about never having an actual portrait done of her, but always being used in sort of an allegorical sense. Did that bother her at all? You know, I don't know. I think she, on one level, she probably loved the sort of monopolization of her time, <laughs> of his time, because she would be posing for him and they would have those moments together and mm -hmm. um, they're probably quite private moments when she studied when she posed for him um but yes I think you know she thought of herself as a real person um who had you know thoughts <laughs> of her own um you know so yes I think that that that's that's very true um I think there's a, a real possibility of that um in that way yeah, I mean, she definitely, you know, I don't know, hurt perhaps, but it probably resulted in anger. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, you know, I mean, she she was not easy to get along with. So, you know, and there are two sides to that story. She was often quite demanding to Rodin. He, you know, there was, back in the 80s, there was a very, a very straightforward way of approaching it all, which was that Rodin was bad. Clodel was a, totally a victim. And the, rea the, the reality was much more nuanced than that. And one other thing, I don't see anywhere on the website about this exhibition. Oh, it's... So what's the problem? It, <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> it goes to 21, but, you know... I know. Yeah. So yeah. what's happening is we're still getting the image rights for uh, um, some uh, of the works of the exhibition. And until we get the sign off from the owners of those works, we can't post them publicly, but it's ready to go. I mean, my part's done, it's ready to go. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, it'll be up for sure. I know it's it's my priority as well. <laughs> I think I read that when her family uh, committed her to the mental asylum, they did not even have a doctor uh, examine her of that, which was actually common even here at the time. So if you think about that, family wanted to get rid of her. They didn't, the sister that didn't want to share the father's inheritance with her. She was there for 10 years, and then a doctor goes, she doesn't even belong here, send her home, and they wouldn't let her. I mean, that's really an incredible story. Yeah. 
You know, I mean, it is, and it's so, as you said, it's it's not an unfamiliar story. You know, I mean, we see similar things happening today. And, you know, they absolutely went to a doctor separately from Claudel. Um, and at that point in time, you needed just the mother's or just the brother's signature, I think. And, you know, Paul in particular, I mean, the mother was, I think, a bit of a monster. Um, and, but the... The the brother is 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 a is a it's a much more complicated question. He and Kami were very very close growing up, um, and they were both the sort of prodigies of the family. So they really spent time a lot of time together because they sort of understood each other. Um, and you know, and Paul Paul starts out as a very sort of avant garde. Um, symbolist, um, decadent writer of plays and, and, and other works. Um, but then like many men, <laughs> creators at the end of the 19th century, he has a hard and fast conversion to Catholicism. Um, and, you know, I think there is a sense that we don't know for certain that, it, that this actually happened, but it has been suggested that um, Claudel had an abortion and that Paul found out about it. And that was kind of really um, not something that, you know, um, he was able to deal with. Um, that's kind of all speculation because we don't have any definitive evidence of any of that. But I suspect, I mean, it was probably just as much the case that the family were embarrassed and outraged by her running around with a married man. Um, and Paul hated Rodin um, with a passion. Um, even after Claudel had been in the institution for many years, he still hated Rodin. And, um, you know, he when he found out that Rodin wanted to put a room in the Rodin Museum devoted to Camille Claudel, um, Paul said, absolutely not. You know, I don't want you associated with her. And um, eventually he gave in and he gave some works. And so now you have the wonderful room. And I think it's actually useful to have that room there to balance out the monolithic story of Rodin at the Musée Rodin. Um, but yeah, for, for a while, Paul was not. Um, but Paul also never got a discharge from the hospital, <laughs> never came to collect the body when she died. So, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> so that would be the last question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, one more. Here you go. Get out of the way. Sorry. Where did you find all that information? You know, it's already not working. But where did you find all, did you find all that information? Well, there. there family? Oh, there. You know, I mean, it was the the family still exists, and um, the family, many of them, still own works by her, her or have quite famously sold some in recent years. Um, and the family sort of branched out in different directions um, and they're sort of spread all over the place now. And they all still have materials related to Claudel, um, you know, um, photographs, you know. So, but they also all have slightly probably different versions of the story of Camille Claudel. <laughs> and what happened, um, but there are a number of, there's, there's a whole book of correspondence. Um, uh, there's a new edition that came out in, I think, 2019. Um, and it's extraordinary. It's well worth reading. I mean, she was so witty. She had such an acid tongue. <laughs> um, and you get a really, a really interesting sense of her as a person through the letters and also through letters that were written to her as well. The letters between her and Rodin can be, quite quite extraordinary um you know she and very intimate I mean there's this one letter where she writes to him and she says you know I slept naked last night so I could imagine you were next to me you know I mean these are these extraordinary um relationship intense relationship between the two of them but yes there there is there's a lot of material um but in a way thankfully because Rodin was so closely associated with her and so much has been kept of Rodin's uh, information and documents that, that helps us with Claudel as well. Thank you so much. This is incredible. Thank you.